Ready? Hello, good afternoon. Thank you again for staying with us and for those of you who are new for joining us this afternoon. We're really excited to uh, conclude our symposium by um, having our keynote speaker, Dr. Karen Mary Davalos, here with us today. Uh, Dr. Davalos is a trained, is trained as a cultural anthropologist and she received her PhD from Yale and her MA and BA from Stanford University. Currently, she's a professor of Chicano and Latino Studies at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, where she has launched a major initiative, Chicano Art Since 1848, a multi-volume book and digital archive. Her work explores questions of representation, agency, power, spirituality, and feminist methods. She's an independent curator and an author of three books about Chicano art. This summer, her latest book, Chicana Remix, or Chicana Remix, Art and Errata since the, since the 60s, will be published by NYU Press. And we're really thrilled for her to be here because she also serves um, on the board of directors for Self-Help Graphics. And many of the artists who are here with us today work with self-help. And so it's really exciting to have her here. And we're also really fortunate to have her join the University of Minnesota because she is you know, one of the most prominent Chicana art historians in the country. And so to have her with us here today and to join the arts community and the Twin Cities community is a true pleasure. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Bia, That was a very kind uh, introduction. Thank you for sticking around. Um, it's been a wonderful two days, and I hope this is inspiring. You'll hear a lot of repetition. Um, I didn't invent these ideas. They come from the artists themselves. I'm just here to reflect back on some of them. What I want to do for you today is speak about the ways in which self-help graphics demonstrates um, world-based art making or art-based world making. Um, so I have three parts for this presentation where I'll look at self-help graphics as a generator of an art-based world making path to social justice. I'm going to provide this context in order to illustrate some larger significance of both the exhibition and the artist's lives that you've heard about today, um, particularly artists of color who are working, uh, who became the subjects of Jesus Estrada Perez's dissertation. So these three topics, um, I'll try to move through quickly. I have a lot of slides. Um, and some of them will not be directly discussed, but go ahead and focus on the images anytime I have them there because I think they're important. So I'll talk about some origins with the Chicano movement, the signature programs. I'm going to look at three. I think you've heard about some of these already. And then I'll look at uh, the specific workshop, Taillet, that inspired Jesus and his dissertation that, and the way in which it inspired the show. All right. Self-help graphics was formed during the Chicano movement, a social and political drive for justice, equality, and self-determination. Working from a garage, Sister Karen Bocalero, a Franciscan nun and artist, invited Frank Hernandez Carlos Bueno, who was a painter who had studied at La Esmeralda, the National Art School in Mexico City, and had also invited Antonio Ibanez, a self-taught artist and photographer who was Bueno's partner. She invited them to join her in the creation of a print studio. At the time, they were working out of a garage. Now, because the artistic collaborations between Bueno and Ibanez are largely overlooked and their gay relationship is unnamed, forgotten, and hidden in the ongoing history telling and storytelling about self-help graphics, I begin my presentation with an acknowledgement to their queer presence as a cornerstone of the organization. As you'll see during my presentation, their contributions manifest throughout self-help graphics early history and became the starting point for one of their signature pro one of the signature programs. So, working as early as 1970 in the garage, Sister Karen and her contemporaries aimed to provide a physical and communal environment that would champion the flourishing Chicano movement in Los Angeles. The co-founders were inspired in, by and contributed to the spirit of rebellion and resistance, the methods and rationale that Mexican Americans and working class communities 
were using to challenge the imposed social, political, economic, and aesthetic conditions. Specifically, self-help graphics formed during the turbulence of the 1960s and 70s, those decades of change around the globe, and the question the political and social structures of American society. Throughout the American Southwest and later in the Midwest, the movimiento arrives here around the 80s, Mexican Americans were concerned with the equality and the eradication of discrimination. Organized by students, farm laborers, third party electorates, and pro immigrant activists, they mobilized communities to improve K through 12 schools, for better working conditions and equal rights among workers, for political representation among Latino voters and non voting constituents. Self identification and articulation of community identity were central to the movement. As a group, they questioned the American myths of dominance, particularly cultural and social dominance that American and European values, behaviors, beliefs, and arts were superior to all others, and especially Mexican and indigenous ones. Youth of, the Mex of Mexican descent who began to identify as Chicano were among the most radical, adopting a traditionally pejorative term as an act of defiance. Chicano is an identity between Mexican and American. It's not a cultural identity, it's an ideology. It's not about who's your daddy, where's your mama, but a political and ideological position. As some, several poets have once said, one is not born a Chicano, one becomes a Chicano. Now I need to take a pause and talk to you a little bit about terminology. Oops. Um, we use the term, or I'll use the term Chicano movement because it has historical uh, meaning. But the word Chicano itself is obviously gender specific and younger people, people younger than myself, are very much attuned to these issues. Uh, and there's, you know, some of those terms up there were ways in which feminists were dealing with the uh, gender specificity. But the latest term, Chicanx, is an attempt to be more inclusive. However, my tongue, and I'm not a poet, is having difficulty with the word that rhymes with Kleenex. <laughs> and not a prop. <laughs> so today I'm going to introduce a new word. Chicanesh. And again, I'm not a poet, so this is actually a challenge. I'm hoping that my terrible, terrible use of this new term inspires the poets in the room to give us a word that is not exclusionary, but does not rhyme with Kleenex. <laughs> All right, let me keep going. This countercultural imagination and interrogation of European and American traditions, as well as global changes in Latin America and Europe, inspired Sister Karen to create a print studio for and with East Los Angeles Chicanesh communities. As a Franciscan nun, Sister Karen promoted the Franciscan philosophy that human potential is expressed through everyday effort, practicing, <coughs> nurturing the value each person has to offer. That is, every person can realize genius, given the chance. And this philosophy was the foundation of her work at self-help and the idea of making art with community. <clears throat> Sister Karen aimed to produce graphic art in support of self-determination, empowerment, and transformation. And her colleagues and her turned to printmaking because it was immediate, accessible, inexpensive, could be produced in multiples, and could be placed, because it is in multiples, in public places. These qualities continue to make print, prints an important media for artists invested in social change. And you heard about that this week. Similar to murals, <clears throat> another media to which artists gravitated during the Chicano movement, prints are placed in public view, in store windows, on utility poles, or at meeting halls, schools, and public buildings. As such, Prints do not rely on the gallery circuit or the museum world for validation or exhibition. And the artists you heard on these panels have other media and practices for doing the same. They can also be spread to multiple locations, 
because they're produced in large numbers. And in self-help graphics, they usually produce them in runs of 75 to 150. Printmaking also challenges the image of the genius artist who works alone, undisturbed in his studio. And I don't know if there's a gender to that particular character, but the image of the artist is always gendered as male. Prints require collaboration between artists and master printers, those with the technical know-how. And that's also something that is not um, valued within the art world, the Western art world. From its inception in the 1970s, self-help graphics helped to support a generational network among a group of artists. And this is one of those moments of art-based community making. And so I have a few slides of the folks that I want to bring out today, Carlos Bueno and Antonio Bañez. As I mentioned, they were a couple, and they frequently signed their work together, Ibanez y Bueno, Bueno y Ibanez. That joint signature so beautifully predates the moment when California granted legal protection to same-sex marriage in 2008. They were doing this in the 70s. It also, I believe, could be used to activate queer space within self-help graphics and its archive. Other artists in that network that formed community through self-help graphics, Linda Vallejo, Michael Amesqua, Peter Tovar, Irena Cervantes, Diane Gamboa, Gronk, Patsy Valdez, Leo Limon, and many others. They all experimented with visual imagery and technical printing processes that gave self-help graphics an international reputation by the 1980s. These artists built or transformed the signature programs of self-help graphics that I'll describe shortly. During its long tenure, it's now 43 years old, nearly every Chicanesh artist of Southern California and many others from throughout the South American Southwest, and I bring you two slides to show you some of that today, Malakias Montoya and Ralph Maradial, um, have produced in self-help. In its four decades of existence, Self-Help Graphics now supports an intergenerational network of artists. And the current artist leaders include Yolanda Gonzalez, Miguel Angel Reyes, and I had to bring this, this image because I think it's absolutely gorgeous, Alex Donis, Delila Mendez, and Dewey Tafoya. So those are the current intergenerational leaders. So what I, what I want to sum up with is that, you know, if we look at the early years, one kind of community-based making was among the artists themselves. And as you can hear from the panelists um, that we brought together from Los Angeles, even though they were all in LA, it took an event in, in Minnesota to kind of introduce them face to face, right? So that community-based making is obviously important. Let me move now to the signature programs and self-help. Self-help graphics is widely appreciated for three signature programs, um, Dia de los Muertos, Barrio Global Art Studio, and the Professional Printmaking Program. They actually call it PPP, but that's not good for my tongue either. <laughs> um, in French, it's atelier, which I'm not good at doing. I like to call it taller in Spanish. So in very different ways and with very different practices, these three programs generate community and belonging among Chicanesh and others who value empowerment and social transformation. So let me begin with that first signature program. It's important to understand that Day of the Dead is a complex phenomenon, and the slides I'm going to show you should confuse you. Um, as celebrated by self-help graphics, Dia de los Muertos, includes a procession and other musical and theatrical performances in the streets of the city. It includes public art installations known as ofrendas, the exhibition of two-dimensional and three-dimensional works in their gallery or in other spaces. It includes culinary arts by local vendors and other creative elements 
produced by participants and by artists. And some of that includes face painting, puppetry, and costuming. During its earliest years, Self-help graphics events took place at a nearby cemetery, and they included a Catholic mass, as well as Aztec dancers, although it's been the blessings by the Aztec danzantes that has persisted into the 21st century. In the past 20 years, the massive crowds nearly engulf the danzantes, but it's their beating drums that rhythmically pace the procession and generate solidarity in the streets. As I noted, musical entertainment and food have become a significant part, and I would argue that's part of the corporeal experience, another aspect of spiritual homage that resists simple classification. In fact, religious studies scholar Laura Medina and sociologist Gil Cardena emphasize that there's a season of preparations for the dead that intertwine aesthetic, political, and spiritual experiences. They offer the term Dias de los Muertos because the preparations and commemorations take place over multiple weekends, depending on funding, and in a variety of places and among diverse populations. It's not one day that we honor the dead in Los Angeles, it's many days. So, Dia de los Muertos commemorations produced by self-help graphics have received widespread media coverage over the past 40 years, and the organization is broadly appreciated for introducing the homage to the dead to Los Angeles area, area communities and for expanding its cultural forms, some of which that uh, Tina discussed that it's debated here. I just want to point out um, why it's been debated, perhaps. So unlike its roots expression in Mexico, Self-Help Graphics Day of the Dead mixes spiritual and political components. Furthermore, while practiced within families in Mexico, and maybe you need just a little clarification here, as, as Tina noted, people go to the cemetery, but like the way we celebrate uh, Fourth of July in the United States, everybody's doing fireworks, but it's only with your family that you're celebrating. I mean, there's the, there's the block party, but it's an individual family experience. Same thing had been happening, had been happening in Mexico. Self-Help Graphics inaugurated the celebration for Dia de los Muertos as a community-wide celebration, generating an inclusive and broad range of participants. The public component, the procession, had no Mexican counterpart when Antonio Ibanez and Carlos Bueno introduced the celebration to Chicanesh artists and led them on a short pilgrimage from Evergreen Cemetery in 1972. This communal procession to honor the dead was the foundation for later celebrations that would galvanize Chicanesh, Mexican, and other residents of Los Angeles. By 1976, Self-Help Graphics was drawing thousands of participants, and by the 1980s, when the celebration was reintroduced throughout the United States in cities such as Chicago, it was the shared communal and public format that continued to inform how communities pay homage to their dead. With this event, Self-Help Graphics directly contributes to the formation of a Chicanesh and more broadly Latinesh, if you allow me, a Latinesh sense of place and belonging. Thus, contrary to traditionalist and folkloric narrative that emphasizes stasis and habitual activity from one generation to the next, Dia de los Muertos in Los Angeles is informed by the pressures of modernity such as the racial and gendered inequalities of capitalism and market economies, the displacement of working class <coughs> communities due to urban initiatives, and the forms of surveillance and violence produced by the nation state. I suggest the inaugural public ceremony in 1972 and the subsequent ceremonies 
were a response to the social subjection of Mexican Americans. Within its first few years, Day of the Dead became a platform to bring awareness to and protest against social injustice. Artists of self-help graphics turned their collective attention to police repression, gang violence, military recruitment, and domestic violence. In the 21st century, artists have used Dia de los Muertos to focus attention on inhumane detention and deportation of immigrants, the women of Juarez, substance abuse, and the U.S.-Iraq war. Therefore, Dia de los Muertos, as practiced by self-help graphics, presents innovation through, not a break from, tradition, as it is proposed, as it proposes a critique of modernity. The second signature program. In 1975, Sister Karen hired Linda Vallejo to lead Barrio Mobile Art Studio. Michael Amesqua and Peter Tovar had already converted this panel truck into a dark room, a silk screen facility, and added multiple art supplies in a, a bunk. But if they needed an artist to design the curriculum and travel to schools, jails, prisons, and convalescent homes to teach those who did not have access to artistic expression. Linda was that first artist. And it was an ideal method for self-help graphics to employ artists. It was their first major self-help program of the organization. And the Barrio Mobile Art Studio flourished between 1975 and 1985, but it was phased out in the decade immediately following the 1978 statewide proposition that dramatically cut school funding in California. The infamous Prop 13 that reduced property taxes to 1%, um, the property taxes feed the school budgets, right? And it thus made it nearly impossible to fund school programs beyond the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic. It obviously had a more negative effect on our inner city schools that rely on a smaller tax base. However, in 2014, artists pushed the organization to relaunch the Barrio Mobile Art Studio. I'm gonna break from this and play, if I can do technology and talk at the same time, which I think I can, play a little video for you while I finish. So you can see what it looks like. So now with peer-to-peer -peer workshop facilitation, professional development, and social entrepreneurship, 25 artists administer Body and Mobile Art Studio. The new design allows self-help graphics to not only hire artists, but to pay them a competitive fee. In this way, the Body and Mobile Art Studio allows the organization to reinforce its mission of self-help and its vision of equity and social justice. Barrio Mobile Art Studio, as you can see, serves a broad audience. And because the program is mobile, it allows self-help graphics to expand its work to communities beyond East Los Angeles and Boyle Heights, the places where it's been housed. Taking art creation to the streets and to the schools fosters the formation of identity, empowerment, and critical consciousness. For the past two years, Barrio Mobile Art Studio, and as a board member, I'm very happy to say this, has been the most successful, successful revenue stream for the organization, and the most important program for reaching school-age youth. So to sum up at this point, what I'm demonstrating to you is that self-help graphics has combined art, politics, and commerce in a way that does not compromise the vision that Sister Karen uh, began with. Those are the kinds of categories, art, commerce, and politics, that we don't think go together when we talk about Chicano movement or social justice movements. Um, let me go back to my slides. Okay, the last one, the atelier. 
The need to establish a professional fine arts print workshop emerged when Roberto de la Rocha was experimenting with avocado images in different shades of green. I always find that funny. I don't know why. <laughs> the technical challenges stimulated the group to seek better equipment and skills. They needed a master printer, someone with the technical know-how, to create the artist's vision. Stephen Grace was the first master printer of self-help graphics, and in 1982, he and Gronk, an artist known for his collective activity with OSCO and experimentation, pulled 10 prints. Three of the prints sold for $50, and the proceeds went to the organization. But Sister Karen was concerned about exploiting the artists, so she created a marketing agreement that would become the foundation for the taller today. So some background for those of you who aren't familiar with the process. As I noted, prints are made in multiples, and each print created is not considered a copy, but rather an original, an original impression, since each image is slightly different. The entire set of impressions from the same screen or matrix is called an addition, all right? So in acting the mission, <coughs> Sister Karen decided that half of the print edition is property of self-help graphics, and the other half of the edition is for the artist to sell. And I just have to point out, the young man in the front row, seated and closest to us, is Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> they also agree on the release date and the price, so the arts organization does not undersell or undermine the artist's efforts, right? So a portion of the prints, in addition to selling, um, them and distributed them for their own inventory. A portion of the prints are distributed to organizations and museums. One place is the, the University of California, Santa Barbara, my colleague Jessica's um, alma mater, um, that houses the archive of the organization, as well as to institutions um, that collect and preserve Mexican and Chicanesh art, including the National Museum of Art in Chicago. Um, speaking here in the city, in the Twin Cities, I'm hoping that our arts institutions would take note, because we have many um, prints that could go into collections here. So the remaining prints, as I mentioned, go into inventory or sold to the public, with the proceeds going to support the organization. So that professional printmaking program started in, two, in 1983 and it continues today. I want to just briefly touch on the atelier that inspired Jesus to, to create his dissertation project. The first um, gay Latino atelier curated by um, Miguel Angel Reyes. This was the first public attention within self-help graphics to its own queer life and aesthetic. In 2008, Miguel Angel Reyes invited nine artists to produce graphically compelling prints for the 49th Professional Print Program. Those artists included Alex Alvaroff, Alex Adonis, Ruben Esparza, who's with us, Jeff Herrique, oh, I'm probably butchering his name. Herrique, thank you. <laughs> Rigo Maldonado, Luciana Martinez, who's also Luciano. here with us. Um, Rico Hector, is here. I'm a ghost. Oh, I was <laughs> skipping over Rigo, sorry. <laughs> Hector Silva, Paul, Paul Sweeney, and Joey Terrell, also with us. In his gallery essay, Michael Greg Michaud focused on the challenges these artists experience because of homophobia and AIDS, as well as the hyper-masculine normative expectations placed on men. I think it's interesting, ironic, tragic, that the panelists talked about the same challenges today. The atelier was presented, quote, as an offering one that commemorates and celebrates these artists' experiences as they hand it over to the next generation a legacy and affirmation of the power and immeasurable importance of free artistic expression, end quote. 
I think it's fitting that their work allowed us to remember Jesus, and I want to reclaim Joey's um, print remembrance in honor of Jesus' work here in the Twin Cities and to the way in which he allowed us to gather together and bridge across the continent. Their work opened space for a new generation of gay and lesbian transgender artists working more regularly within his self-help graphics. So the prints I showed you is probably really far back. But the prints I showed you of the intergeneration that is leading now at self-help graphics, the majority of those identify as gay, lesbian, and transgender. Dalila, Paola, Mendez, Alex Donis, our own Miguel Angel Reyes, um, and others. Let me conclude. As you know, community-based art is frequently a code word for low quality. I have brought you dozens of slides to illustrate that self-help graphics is not amateur. And I brought you a range of artistic modes of production I did so to argue along with my colleague George Lipsitz that self-help graphics is producing community, not just art. In the work of self-help graphics, it is generating art-based world-making, a vital process for communities everywhere that have less than secure access to political representation and less than welcome status in the nation. Community formation is a vital act of civic engagement, empowerment, and identity. And it's through that process that people place themselves in the world. World making, the title of our symposium. Now more than ever, we face the restrictions placed on our movement, our access to transgender and women's health care, as we face growing association of terrorism with people of color and with all queers, and as we face threats to our notion of equality, our notion of government and democracy, our notion of transparency and justice, we recognize that these types of organizations and the artists that support them are vital to our survival of democracy here and throughout the world. Thank you. Time for questions. Yes, we have time for questions. Comments. I came in a little bit late, but I was wondering, did you at all mention about the efforts against gentrification of Boyle Heights and looking at self graphics as a target? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> because as a board member, I, I have a, I have a, a, a agreed upon response that I'm allowed to say in public. Oh, okay. I, which is self-help graphics has always been working in and with and for community. Yes. It came from community. Yes. It's not from a, an outside source. Yes. Um, Sister Karen's vision of using the space to exhibit the art was only to support the artist. <clears throat> so exhibitions are always designed after a taillet is complete in order to showcase the work and sell it. In other words, it's not a gallery commercial space for the sake of being a gallery commercial space. Um, it's, it, it, in some years, it didn't even have a gallery. It was just studio, and they would use the walls. As you can see in that one picture with our young Miguel and Hel Reyes, you know, there's, it, it's, like a, it's like a space. It's, it's not a gallery. It's a space they use. Um, when we acquired a building in 2011, I'm pretty sure the year is, 
uh, we, we deliberately designed a gallery space. And the, and the place on, on Cesar Chavez Avenue used to be uh, Broadway, Broadway, right? Brooklyn Avenue. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. I knew it was the wrong one, that's what I was asking. <laughs> Brooklyn <laughs> Avenue, started with a B. Um, they also had a, a gallery space, but you know, that was, that was not the impetus for the organization. I don't know if that answers your question. There are commercial galleries starting up, for those of you who don't know LA, some um, in, in East LA, Boyle Heights, specifically in Boyle Heights. There are commercial galleries mostly owned by people from New York. So very different, now I'm off, now I'm off script, very different from what sure. we do. <laughs> No, I, I just so I mean I totally uh, support South Park Graphics remaining in the community, doing what they've been doing, and I do not support the antagonistic attitude about them because there is a difference. Yeah. And I would ask all of you to say that on Facebook and social media. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with the change of leadership within South Park Graphics, has there been an effort to? reinvestigate or include queer artists within the programming at South Park Graphics? I would say yes. I, I, I would say it's a combination of coming from the artists themselves and the leadership. So we have a, we have a different model in the nonprofit world. Um, we call it a shared leadership model, for lack of a better term. So instead of having an executive director and an artistic director, which usually the artistic director is underneath, we have a kind of parallel model and everybody's hands on. So the artistic director, we don't actually call him that, he's a program director, Joel Garcia, has to know all of the stuff in the front house and the associate director has to know all the programming. And it's made for better um, administrative uh, successes, so we're able to increase our revenue stream because everybody knows what's going on, and so the grants are written more strongly, for example. But we also, because we do not have an artistic director, we have an art, and that's for those of you who have not experienced in your own organizations, you know, when your founder dies, it's across the board, it's called founder syndrome. You know, does the organization dissolve? And to self-help graphics artist credit, we didn't. Um, but we nobody felt they could step into her shoes. And and I still think the her death is still too close. It's ten years, twenty years, going on twenty years. Um, that no one would ever presume to step in her shoes. So the model we've been using at self-help is an artist roundtable, and it's the artist roundtable that has driven us to be more inclusive. Um, so this, we have a current, in this season we have an atelier that is also focused on queer artists. I wish I knew the name, but um, I'm not focused on program right now. I'm focused on I, I, acquisition I, of the building. I could ask a little bit of that. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's always been queer artists, but just again. Yes. But it was, Specifically, the Dylan's the first one. Did it was also, also, also a lesbian one? Right. Either it was before or after? Or I think it was after you guys. Exactly. Yeah. So it's specifically there was the first one, but there were always been queer artists. And, and that's why I used my words carefully there. That it was the first public. Yeah. Yeah. Because I did a, a age-related soul screen, which was my first soul screen in 1992. So way back. And and my argument about Carlos Bueno and Antonio Ibanez, they were present. Yeah. It was queer space and self-help. It was unnamed. Um, I haven't found anybody who would tell me the, the how and the why yet, but it's clearly unnamed. Because I had to keep poking this ask about, someone signed their names together? Oh, who are those artists? <laughs> someone pulled me aside and said, Karen, didn't you know? They were lovers. They were <laughs> And I said, no. And I've been doing work on self-help graphics as a scholar for 20 years. So, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the archiving and the, the collection? Um, and give us a little cross-section of some of the people that are housed in that collection. So in 1986, um, a librarian at University of California, Santa Barbara, Sal Garena, got a 
super brilliant idea to begin asking our arts organizations to keep their material and perhaps, if they could, donate them to the institute, his library that he was running. He still runs that collection. Um, and so it, the first set of materials that went to UC Santa Barbara were the institutional papers. So um, grants, grant applications, uh, plans for Day of the Dead, um, um, personnel records that are closed until a certain time period. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've looked at. Um, exhibition documentation, you know, checklists from an exhibition, what's in the show, the artist statements, the uh, bios, any, any kind of programming that happened, there was paperwork. And I'm talking, I think we're up to 375 linear feet. That's how they measure collections, you know, not like books on the shelf, but the linear feet. In addition to the documentation, what you would call administrative files, um, University of Santa Barbara also preserves and collects one of the first numbers in the editions of all the talleres. Not of all the work produced at Self-Help Graphics, but of the taller, okay? And we're up to, I don't know, uh, if you were 49, we're uh, at, at 10, we're up to 50 something. I, I have seen digital uh, files of those we have at least 732 prints produced through the PPP. And those are all housed at UC Santa Barbara. Like I said, they, they take, they split the run, right? They split the edition. So the artist gets, you, you guys are gonna know this better than I, number one? No, no. You, you get, you get the artist one that's proof, signed yeah. as one yeah. in the edition. The organization gets two. Yeah. Artist gets number three, organization gets number four, etc. In those first three uh, items of the edition, one of those is going to <coughs> UC Santa Barbara. So in other words, it's it's the you know it's a really good imprint, it's a really good impression, and that's being preserved. He does not let them out. He will let you have the DG clay before he'll let them be long. Yeah. We've tried. <laughs> so I like that. We like yes, <laughs> we do. So the organization has its own collection that we circulate, although I need a funder to reframe and uh, do some conservation work on that. Because, you know, when funding is good, the frames are beautiful. When funding is bad, it's from Target. <laughs> I want them all to be beautiful. I want them all to be beautiful. So I need a funder. 732 items. That does not count the ones that are produced in the open print studio, which we hope to someday be renaming to the Sister Karen Bocalero print studio. There's another studio that's more experimental. They can do, you know, um, they can break the rules. So, yeah. Any other questions? It's been a long time. <laughs> and the back. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for your talk, and it was great to see this nice genealogy of self-help. Um, you know, I think growing up here in Minnesota as an artist and studying this, uh, we romanticize LA and self-help. It's like this mecca of mm -hmm. all great Chicanakis art that ever existed in the world. and. Um, it can be very daunting as an artist and somebody working in the community to try to create spaces here, like Tina was saying um, during the roundtable of women of color, right? Like Minnesota just gets left off the map constantly. And so I would just love to hear your thoughts now that you've been here for almost seven six, months. Seven months. <laughs> You're an expert in this area. No, I'm just um, but you know, just because you do have the perspective of kind of both places now, um, what what is self-help doing that we could be doing here to 
whether it's institutionally or interpersonally, to like kind of reinvigorate um, and push our art spaces into something as phenomenal as self help? Um, I'm going to refuse the answer. Um, but I'll be polite. Um, oh, you're so Minnesota nice <laughs> So, the reason I'm going to refuse the answer is you're doing good work. You don't need to turn to Los Angeles for inspiration. Um, what we're doing in self-help uh, is part of a trend. We want to buy the building. We want to own our own brick and mortar space. If I would recommend that to anybody, it would be that. But um, I don't think that should be the priority when you know we're talking about water is sacred, deportation, and and uh, the police state, and those are the issues that are important here. You know, I mean, they're important in LA, but like, they're right here. They're our neighbors and they're next door. Um, what I think that is so amazing about the Twin Cities, and I'm glad Dougie's here, because I, you know, I'm not even talk about you, Dougie. <laughs> Douglas Padilla, as an artist who's been very welcoming to me, he's a co-founder with um, Javier Tavera of Grupo Sol del Corazon that Tina mentioned. Um, there's, a, there's a fascinating way that Doug, Dougie and Javier have been able to think across Latino populations in ways that are so Mexican, but something more. I don't have the language for it uh, because I'm from LA. And all we do in LA is Chicanesh. <laughs> we invite people in, but it's, you know, it's Chicanesh, you know, it's, it, it, because we have the numbers to, to dominate and make the rules and set the parameters of the play. Um, but here it's a different, you know, it's, it's a different population. Um, so, wh what was the question? <laughs> um, the question was, what would you recommend? No, I refuse that. You're doing what you need to do, and it's beautiful, it's important, and it's generative. And uh, I would just think we should make more collaborations, you know? I would love to see what it would look like to bring artists to self-help graphics, you know, artists from the Twin Cities to self graphics and make prints. Mm -hmm. And what would it look like to have an exhibition with queer artists from here and our Latinx queer artists, you know, um, because they have shared um, more than experience. It's technique and approach to art. That's what I'm seeing. Like every time I go to a show, I'm like, that reminds me of so and so's work, and that reminds me of so and so's work. And uh, I, it'd be great to have those conversations among the artists, I mean the curators, yeah, you know, it makes me sweat and pant and get excited, but uh, the conversations among the artists are what is important, and they, from my experience in other places, you know, that they, they know how to talk to each other, um, and it'd be great to facilitate that. So sorry I confused your question. <laughs> Tina? Self-help that is in the process of trying to establish a permanent physical space. And I just remember when I was at the Latino Museum Space Program as far back as 2007, there's a lot of conversation about how do the Latinx organizations pull it off. Like, you know, I, I mean, is there conversations about, I know you could sell the print, but that doesn't typically pay the rent. You have to you have to have a capital campaign. Yeah. So we're in the silent phase of a capital campaign right now. But for sustaining it, is there some conversations about um, combining nonprofit with for profit, like having some commercial or I know one place was talking about how they sold tomatoes, like something totally different. It's a sort of income generating. Um, yes, but I also want to I also want to make sure we're not talking about like. Art making is separate from commerce. That's why I talked about the signature program of the Tayet. It's always been invested in make some money for artists. 
And what we'd like to do is change the language around the practices of self-help so that developers, the city, the urban planners, see that work as development, as economic development. Because that's what drives, that's what makes, you know, if you want to make an urban planner in a city, a city uh, elected official hot and pan and get wet, talk to them about economic development. <laughs> that's orgasm to them. <laughs> you know, to be crude, but they, that, all they can think of is, how can I generate revenue? So we're trying to use their language to say, what we do at Self-Help is revenue stream, is producing revenue for and in the community. So one of our signature, I wouldn't say signature programs, but one of our B-level programs, you know, if the A-level programs are the Day of the Dead and the Tayyad and the... Um, one of our B-level programs is we have Mercadito, you know, almost every month now. Um, we bring in the, the local do-it-yourself, and we call it do-it-together, actually, because we don't want to emphasize the individual, that whole American individuality. Um, do-it-together, art-making practices, and all the artisans and, and, and um, anti-mall, uh, business owners, small business owners, bring their product and sell at our building. And we're hoping to use that as a, a leverage to the city. Yeah. <laughs> These are my students. Hi. Great ones. <laughs> questions at office hours so you only get 10 minutes this week that's true yeah okay. we're in final exams soon so oh. they get extra points for coming out yeah. can you can you elaborate a bit on Jesus and his role that you know the uh, the, the reason the, the man behind the presence of kind of why this what his what he did out of self-help graphics? So he was inspired by the, the show that the Tayyad that Miguel had put together, Homo Hombre. And um, that was the focus for, that was the foundation for his dissertation work. Okay. Want to add to that? Oh. Oh. So he was a writer. He was a, he was a, oh, he was a PhD student here okay. in American right. Studies. So the, uh, all the artists who are here today were all featured in his dissertation. Well, uh, no, 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 the only one who's not of it. Oh, you yeah, want no. I mean, the Italian, but it was part of the dissertation. Yeah. The actual writing of the dissertation. Yeah, the writing thing was yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And, and another, another way to, um, what you heard on the panels this afternoon is, you know, I could have contextualized their work through Viva. Um, but the research I had done with Monica Palacios being a creative writer when I interviewed her about Viva left off mostly. I mean, she admitted it was there, but it just, you know, it's not in the interview um, that the artists were doing important work at the same time, the visual artists. So. Yeah, because she was in charge of that uh, aspect of the yeah. research. Yeah. Are any of his papers going to be published or anything that he's written? We're working on that. We, um, we're still, because we've been so busy with the show, like we actually have to crack the code on his laptop. And that's something that I have to get permission from the university because it's a university account. And so we've sort of been stalled on that because I've contacted them, but they haven't responded about how best to do that. So because he had, so he had written proposals and he had actually analyzed prints and images. Um, so like your, uh, your images as well. So, so he had those those pieces, and then he had uh, a couple, uh, several chapters that he had drafted. And so, so our goal is, uh, Eden Torres and I, the code writer, the goal is to bring it together and to try and publish it. But that was a project that is going to take a little bit more time, um, in part just because we were so busy working on on this event, and getting this set up. And we might be able to. I know a lot of the uh, interviews he did with you all um, are also on different accounts because we were right here together, so we were listening and talking about interviews. So that might be something that we do get access, then we can also share back with you so you can have those interviews. I know some of you in our conversations mentioned one of them. 
Yeah, and then my goal, my <laughs> project, Chicana, Chicano Art since 1848, one aspect of it is a digital archive. And so I hope to be able to have that material in this digital archive. Don't hold your breath, count about five to six years from now it would be launched. But then the world could see, you know, I'm creating a public archive, accessible hopefully through your cell phone. Um, and that's, you know, part of the Part of the work that I do to how to give back to artists is to not just write about it, but get it documented, get it put in an archive for other scholars and other curators to use. Are we at the end of the hour? You're looking exhausted. <laughs> so thank you so much for sticking around. Thank you. I just want to remind you that the exhibit will be on display through May 13th, so please tell your friends to come see it. And I just want to thank and give another round of applause for the artists. So, and to also finally remind folks that we started a memorial scholarship in honor of Jesus Estrada Perez through the Chicano Latino Studies Department, and it funds queer Chicano uh, graduate students' research during the summer. So if you are all, if you, you, know, you can log on to the Chicano Studies website and donate, and we accept all amounts, because everything, or, uh, you know, even $5 counts. And we're at, the, we need 25000 to <coughs> fully fund a fellowship, and we're at 19000 So wow. we're very close to being there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.